Uh, can you guys hear me fine? Uh, a really good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thanks, Anand, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm actually really nervous and also excited because I'm presenting the project that we did in this very lab at our very own Ken seminar in such an illustrious lineup of speakers. I want to thank uh, Professor and Kent organizers for giving me the opportunity and trusting me with it. So I want to talk, so to, for today's topic, some of you have already known some of it, but for who of you doesn't know, it will be a very good, uh, it's an interesting topic. So the topic is, we developed the FE model for the project that we finished to predict reflective cracking potential of an overlay. So before going into the details, I want to just give an overall big motivation why we did. So majority of the overlays in the US are from the state of Illinois. That is nearly 15% of your interstate and nearly 20% of non-interstate overlays are from the state of Illinois. And as you all know, one of the biggest issues when it comes to overlays is reflective cracking. So I don't really wanted us to identify this overlay, what will be the optimal configuration, that is your thickness and your material such that it will be resistant to the reflective cracking. So that is the overall motivation. And so we thought we should uh, find that the optimal configurations for that. So there are twofold objectives. The first objective is you identify your over optimal overlay configurations that performs against reflective cracking through experiments, through large scale testing. So first let's understand like what is a reflective cracking. So when we please asphalt concrete on the top, on the top of a cracked PCC, because due to, due to the movement of the load and due to the tire passing, there is a movement that is happening in the PCC slab. So what happens is the cracks, because of the movement of PCC, it can be due to temperature, it can be due to moisture, it can be due to the loading, because as you can see, as the tire moves, the PCC slab there. Uh, moves, deflects. This results in cracking that starts from the bottom of AC and moves upwards towards the surface. So this is essentially reflective cracking. So what we were focusing is we need to simulate this condition in a large scale test setup. So the movement of tire is achieved by two load actuators that we have. And what it does is it essentially the actuator loads are applied such that it simulates the acid the tire moves over the cracked PCC. As you can see, as the tire approaches, left actuator is applied. When the tire is on top, both actuators are applied. As the tire leaves, only the right side actuator is applied. So you do this for several thousands of cycles. It is essentially tire passing on it continuously. So this is the setup that, uh, that you can see here that we had it in MDM. And I really want to take a moment to thank like the research engineers, Zoe, Professor. I, I don't know how long it took us to get this configuration. Like it took us a lot of time to achieve what we are what you are seeing there. Now, the second fold objective is, once you do these experiments and you identify optimal configuration, the goal is you cannot keep running this test for every new other possible scenarios. Because first of all, it's extremely time consuming and also it's expensive. So the second objective is, okay, you have an experimental data, we have a set of experiments, you model those experiments and you have a data to validate, which is the experimental data. Once a model is validated, that model can be used to predict the overlay cracking potential. So as you can see, whatever uh, we showed earlier the setup, it was model. And then you can see that the load is being applied and you can see it's actually as if the tire is moving. Like how is it in experiments? In this specific today's talk, we'll be just, we'll be mainly focusing on the objective too, about how we developed this model and how we validated it. But to, for the completeness, first I'll briefly introduce the laboratory testing part. And uh, it is a presentation by itself, like how we analyze different things to get the to get where we are. So first, the one of the critical or like the important points when it comes to the experimental testing is achieving consistency. So when you go for large scale testing, there is a space for a lot of heterogeneous conditions. So you when you want to compare the overlay cracking potential of two different scenarios, you want to make sure that rest of all the conditions are exactly similar. So then we are comparing apples to apples, right? So the first was the subgrade, subgrade preparation. So we compacted this fine, fine sand subgrade such that, so when we place a PCC or a cracked uh, concrete slab on it, it doesn't have a non-uniform deflection when we apply the load. So we compacted the subgrade. On top of it, we play, placed uh, three, three, three point seven five inches neoprene sheet. The reason why we did it, so it was it's not natural that you see this sheet in the field. But when we performed the experiments without this sheet, actually we were 
getting cracks like after like two, three weeks of running a cycle just for one scenario. In order to accelerate the testing and also to amplify the deflection, we place the neoprene sheet on top of this compacted subbrain. Now, so we, uh, I'm pretty sure the most of you were uh, there when we had a PCC slab uh, preparation, like uh, we created a PCC slab, which was of six feet cross six feet with a depth of seven inches. And we cut the slab seven inches. So we cut it till six inches because we need to leave that one inches to take the PCC and place it on the subway, right? So that's a logistical issue. So we had to leave one inches for that. And the reason why we cut it, so our question is if overlays, there is a double bar and there might be a low transfer efficiency, right? But we are cutting it all the way. One such is in most in most of the overlays in Illinois or around 80% if I'm not wrong is JBCP. And they are in really bad conditions where you can assume that the double bar is almost ineffective. So that's the reason we cut the uh, PCC slab till six, six inches and then we place it on the subbrain. Now, we constructed a wooden frame on top of the PCC and the idea is if you want to have a one inch, we design different experimental scenarios. If you want to have one inches of, uh, let's say a binder course, we created a wooden frame for like 1.25 inches. So the standard in Illinois is, uh, if you want to achieve the right density, you construct, you, when you lay the material, you flush it to the 1.25 inches. When you were to supposed to compact, it should come to one inches. So that indicates in a way that you reach the right density. Now, on top of PCC, that's where we apply tag coat. And uh, the standard of Illinois is, uh, 0 0.05 like pounds per feet square. However, <coughs> on the edges where when there is the where there is not, we applied a lower rate, which is exactly half. Again, we determined this because we when we are applying a full tack coat rate, it was taking a much longer time to crack, to crack the PCC or to crack the asphalt concrete. So we reduced our, our tack coat application rate by half. And so we did this for when between two asphalt concrete layers as well. So now for different mixes, we preheated the AC in the loose state in oven. And then once it's preheated, we use the mixture to mix it and to reach the temperature, compaction temperature. Now, once it's done, we pour the materials, discharge the materials in this uh, bulk truck, and then we spread and level the materials. As you can see that we place the materials, we leveled it until it flushes out with the top surface. And then we used a handheld roller to compact, to reach the exact height that we needed. And once it's everything is done, if you think about it, PCC is six feet cross six feet, right? And if you were to place ACC, it is six feet cross six feet. But we went, we were, we wanted to cut one feet from either side because you want to, at the end of the day, measure the how reflective packing propagates. It cannot be done on a rough surface because those were the edges. So we had to cut it one feet from the edges to have a clean surface where we can actually see what's going on. Now, I'll just talk about the instrumentation very briefly again. Uh, so we place copper wires on asphalt concrete uh, to measure the reflective cracking load, like the propagation rate. And also we had a camera to see the mechanisms. Where does it start? How does it move? And so on and so forth. In addition to that, we also place the LVDT on PCC. As I mentioned earlier, reflective, one of the main mechanisms of reflective cracking is movement of PCC. We want to know how PCC is getting reflected while doing the experiments. So, I'll quickly go to uh, the scenarios that we did test. So first, non interstate this is the control scenario, which means this is what is commonly used right now in, in the state of Illinois. And we came up with three alternatives. So these alternatives were came about after having a discussion with IDOT and also after performing survey about like how other states approach this problem. So what we thought is maybe we should keep the, for binder courses, we should keep the polymer modified lips, IL 4.75. On the surface course, it was considered maybe we should have a strong list such as SMA 9.5. And for industry scenario, you can see that's your control state, control scenario, which is commonly used. And also we propose different uh, scenarios as well for different thicknesses and different materials. Like you can see with the SMA 9.5 and SMA 12.5, the alternative one, it's a lower thickness compared to the control scenario, but it's a strong material. And the same for different, Alternatives. So these alternatives, in summary, it came about after having a several discussion and after conducting a survey. Now, there were like a lot more discussion around how crack propagated in each and every scenario, but that's a separate topic by itself. The summary is, these were for non-interstate scenarios and interstate scenarios. These were the four alternate, like four configuration that performed better in the experimental testing. And some of the guidance that I don't also needed a guidance on practices about how you should do to avoid this reflective value. 
So as you can really know that you should first of all treat your PCC joint. That's the best way you can control the reflective tracking and use your polymer modified lips on, on, your, uh, on your lips. And one of the biggest thing is the AC-PCC bonding. Or sometimes you can use a strong, uh, yeah, strong, strong mix. But if, if the nominal maximum aggregate size is really large, that means the amount of contact between that, surf, that specific mix over PCC reduces. So that will result in actually AC-PCC debonding. And also assure adequate over the thickness. So there is a, a trade-off between how much thick you can go versus how mix, how strong is your mix in reflect taking the reflective track, right? So this is the summary. Now, so this is the experimental part which is done. We had all the results. Now mechanistic part. So it was developed into three stages. It can be first the model development itself. First, the goal is you want to put you want to simulate what is happening on the test, right? You want to simulate exactly in your model. And then, since now we are talking about reflective tracking propagation, we want to include fracture, fracture modeling, and you want to analyze those fracture properties. The next step, logical step, is you validate. So you identify the right properties such that you, uh, you can validate your results with your experiments. And the third is this step in itself. The model is faster than the experiment. Like running an abacus model is faster, much faster than the experiments. But still, as an agency, they need to find out the reflective tracking potential. They cannot run a backus, and it takes like three hours to run, finish one model. So the goal is we develop the matrix, which with extreme scenarios of extreme thickness, different material properties, different bonding conditions. And we use a very simple surrogate model to predict the overlay tracking potential only using the database, instead of appealing to running the FEM cases in the abacus. So first is the test bed model. As you can see in the picture, so this is how the model looks. Excuse me. So these are the two loading plates, and you can see these two are your asphalt concrete or like your overlay surfaces. And you can see that we cut one one tweak on either side, as exactly what is there in the experimental setup. There is a PCC on which there is a notch, like how we saw it in the experiments. Thank you. And there is a subgrade, and the subgrade is fully encrusted because the subgrade was confined in the steel frame, and it cannot move on either side, and it does not have any rotations. So these are the boundary conditions. Now the materials itself, uh, we use uh, linear viscoelastic material for asphalt concrete, and elastic materials for your both uh, subgrade and your PCC. For interfaces, we use notch between again as I mentioned earlier, notch for PCC, and we use the stick clip model for the interlayer interfaces. The loading. We wanted to simulate exactly what is happening on the test. So the, in the test, we used a load actuator, which is a pressure. So we similarly, we have had a two load actuators that model, and we simulated how the loading scheme is applied in the test in the model. And the plate, just to give an idea, the plate, uh, the plate configuration or the dimensions of the plate were such that that is the dimension, that is the area that a, a dual tire assembly would create when we play, when we were to have an actual scenario. So the dimensions were so chosen such that the area of contact matches with the tire con tire pavement contact area, and uh, the slab dimensions were exactly similar to the ex to the experimental scenario. And so moving on, so this is the overall view of the model, but still that model doesn't have the crack, right? So we mentioned like since you're comparing reflective cracking propagation, you want to add crack fracture parameters to it. So this is the side view of the model. Let's just zoom in. So this is your surface course and your binder course. And as you can see here, the mesh in this region is oh. okay. As you can see, that the mesh in this region is extremely fine. So just to give you an idea, the mesh size of this specific element is 15 mm, which is really small compared to what is like six feet. And the mesh size, mesh element size of this specific point is 0.5 mm. It's really, really small compared to the overall size of the model. And there's a very good reason for it. So what we did is, so we meshed where we expect the cracks, very finer, and we placed the crack. So there are two approaches in Abacus to do this analysis. The first, you can do the cohesive zone, or the second is, you place a crack, and because we know that eventually we are focusing at, at what point it is the system is going to fail, and you want to compare how it's going to fail, like what scenario is creating the worst, worst possible conditions for it to propagate faster. So we placed a crack, and you can see this is a crack tip, so it's a bottom-up crack. So that means when you apply the load, the crack is go going to open from bottom to top. So you can ask, what about the scenarios when there is top to top? So 
this model is a generalized model. This model is perfectly symmetric, but however, that's not the case in the actual experimental, right? There are so many heterogeneous conditions still in the experiments. So when, we, when I place the crack top to down, the crack was never opening. Indeed, the crack was closing. That kind of tells that your region on the top layers of asphalt concrete is in a tension zone, uh, it's in compression zone. So the crack cannot open per se. Whereas in the bottom, there is a opening crack. That means there's a crack, crack is opening from the bottom to top. And what are the fracture parameters that we are measuring or we are computing is your stress intensity factor and J integral. So I will tell like a very quick, what is stress intensity factor? So you can assume it's something, I'm like simplifying it a lot. So let's say that you have a paper, sheet of paper, and you just pull it, it's not gonna tear, right? It takes a lot of effort to tear the paper just by pulling it. However, if you were to make a small hole inside the paper, like you just cut a small circle and you pull it, it's going to tear up much faster. The reason is when there is a flaw in a material, around that flaw, there is a magnification of the stress fields. And those magnifications is a real trouble because even though you are applying a lower load, because of the magnification at those points, it might experience higher levels of stress, which will result in crack. So stress intensity factor is in a way it accounts for that. And coming to J integral. So J integral like can simply be understood for linear elastic materials as a strain energy release rate. So what do you mean, what do I mean by that? Is like you take a ball, let's say there is a glass, right? You drop a ball versus there is an asphalt concrete. Intuitively, what you feel? The glass is going to crack faster, like just going to be there. Because whatever the energy that you are being applied is that all the energy is used to crack on the surfaces. Whereas for asphalt concrete, it takes some of the energy to deform and then probably some energy is left to crack. You guys see the intuition? So that is the J integral. J integral captures the essence of that. Uh, how fast your material can crack, crack and propagate in a material. So this is how the model looks once you run a case. So this is the surface and binder course. Once you run, as you can see, there is an opening in your model on your both surface and binder courses. Now the goal is you want to measure your, uh, your fracture properties around this cracker. Now, I just want to want to appreciate uh, the mesh part because the mesh plays a critical role when measuring such properties. So as you can see, uh, this is a rectangular, right? It's all cube. And this is a crack tip, it's zoomed, and you can see there are five contours. I'll explain what are contours. So you can see the five rings. What happens is your J, when they measure J integral or stress intensity factor, they are going to measure it on the contours. Ideally, your J integral is represents strain energy release rate. It should really, it doesn't matter whether you are measuring it on this contour or the outer layer. So that's the advantage of mathematical advantage of, advantage of J integral. So before you see this model, we have we tried out different mesh, uh, mesh shapes. Example, instead of this rectangle area, we had a circular area with concentrated rings. And the result was we didn't have a smooth J integral curve. As you can see in this curves, so the J integral is plotted for the, along the transverse direction between the loading plates. The curve looks very smooth, right? For this specific mesh. But if I were to do for a different set of mesh, different kind of mesh, the J integral was all over the place. And you can verify your robustness of your mesh in a model by comparing your values of contours. In a theoretical world, all the five contours that is being plotted, which is the brown regions and the red region around it, should all be exactly the same value. But since it's uh, since you are solving it in FEM, which is a numerical in nature, after the first contour, which is the closest one, the rest of all contours, you can see that they are almost matching with each other. That means it says that your model is validated. And this is actually suggested by Abacus to verify. Like, if you do this analysis, do this to check, like if your model mesh is accurate. So just wanted to say that we attained this mesh after several tries, and it, it's kind of robust. Now, before discussing stress intensity factor and J integral, I want to talk about the displacements because displacement gives a very nice idea. If you think about it, in the first step that we apply, which is only your left actuator, left actuator is applying the load, there is a movement of intuitively on the vertical direction, right? So you want to measure what is the relative displacement. So this is your crack, the center line. You want to measure what is the relative vertical displacement between two nodes on either side of the crack. On your step two, which where both load actuators are applied, you want to measure the relative displacement of the two nodes on either side of the crack on horizontal direction. And in the step three, which is exactly the YC versus step one, because now you are just applying the right side actuator. 
for the application of load. So the analysis is, it's CMODs essentially means crack mouth opening displacement. As the name suggests, you want to know on either side of the crack how your opens, how, how, how much it opens, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to show the analysis for a non-interstate control scenario. So this is CMOD1, which happens at step two, where both of your load actuators are applying the load. As you can see, the CMOD keeps increasing. That is your tensile crack, the crack opens on the horizontal direction more and more with the application of load cycles. So you can say that the mode one crack is dominant in this scenario. For mode two, which is most likely to expect it to happen on your step one and step three, you can see that the vertical relative displacement between the two nodes on either side of the crack is not much. It's almost remains the constant. So we can tell safely that the, from the model, the implant shear is insignificant or it's very low compared to your mode one crack. Now, we want to do the same thing. What I shown earlier is just for only one line. Now, it is for the, now I'm plotting this uh, CMOD along the entire uh, length of your asphalt concrete. As you can see, it is your time axis, then this is your length. And the length is, represents the direction as shown in that yellow arrow marks. Transverse direction passing through the center of the two loading plates. So what you can see is there are several interesting things that you can observe. As you come closer towards the loading plate, there is a nice spike. Underneath the loading plate, there is just, there seems to be a sudden dip. And then again, once it reaches the other side of the loading plate, edge of the loading plate, there is a nice spike. And then again, it decreases. So the intuition is when under the, exactly under the loading plate, there is still a compression effect because a load is applied as a pressure. So there is a compression that is not allowing it to open. However, on the edges of the loading plate, it's not so. So you can see that there is a clear jump in the CMOD on the edges of the plate, whereas it is lower underneath the loading plate. And as you can see, as you move away from the load, the displacement reduces because you're moving away from where the load is actually being applied. And this is the case for CMOD2, which happens in your step one and step three. And you can see the same scenarios, but it's not increasing at all. And also one more interesting thing to notice is the U2, you, if you see the units, it's in, it's in the order of 10 power minus 4. Whereas this is specifically like 10 power minus 3. So it is 10 times higher. However, if you were to just see the displacements, like not the relative displacement, but just the displacement, the displacement along the y direction is 10 times higher than the displacement along the x direction because you are applying the load vertically. However, when you measure the relative displacement, it's quite the trend changes very quickly. So now let's talk about that. Whatever you have observed in the, the CMOD, it kind of reflects what in your SIF and J integral. You can see that for your stress intensity factor, it is high near your loading edges of the loading plate. It gets reduced and then it decreases. So in case with your J integral. Now, let's compare. So what does it mean? So if I have two stress intensity factor values, what can I tell? So we'll take this scenario. Your non-interstate uh, interstate control versus non-interstate alternative two. As you can see, it's the same thickness. However, FMA is, in these two configurations, we are varying surface, SMA 9.5 is there when compared to a control scenario. Now, the SIF, the maximum SIF, when you were to plot, when you were to do this analysis, for the second alternative is 26.8, whereas for the control is 33.3. So what we can tell is, if you are, as I mentioned, your SIF is a way to, it's a way kind of tells you what is the stress magnification that happens around the, when there is a flaw. And when the value is really high, you know that this scenario is going to crack faster in the field for the given material properties of in the given model, where compared to the scenario two where you have a lower stress intensity factor. So if you know two stress intensity factor, you can kind of really tell, provided the rest of all the conditions, the model remains the same, you can tell which one is going to crack propagation, which is prone to crack faster. Now, uh, what we did is we need to come up with a fracture parameter to rank our scenarios. So in the experiment, we took the number of cycles for it complete for it to fail completely as as a way to rank our scenarios. That is, versus, let's say that your non-interstate alternate three takes thirty thousand cycles versus alternative two take like fifteen thousand. We say alternative three is better than two. So that's how we rank from the experiments. So if I were to do the same analysis, and I mentioned here average curve just to keep in mind, because when you are measuring stress intensity factor, you are measuring it for both varying surface and binder course of your asphalt concrete. So if you were to take the average stress intensity factor and rank them, it matches exactly with the experiments 
which is the actual rank from the experiments. But there's a catch here. I will ask, I'll tell ahead. So what we are currently lacking is we don't have an uh, strong idea about why we chose average K1. So average K1 turned out to be fine to match the experiments, but we still really don't know what is the best way to characterize when there are like when you can measure stress intensity factor for two, three, uh, two, three layers for different configuration. How will you come up with one unit that kind of tells between these two scenarios this will crack faster? So we haven't, we don't know that yet. However, what we know is the average stress intensity factor between your wearing and your binder course should work and it should can be used to tell which scenario is performing better than other. So as I mentioned, the goal is, so your model is now validated. Now this model cannot be run for newer scenarios by the agencies because it takes still three, four hours to run. So we developed a simulation matrix for different scenarios, for non-interstate and interstate, for extreme different layers, of different extreme levels of thickness and material extreme material properties, and also the different joint opening. So what do I mean by joint opening here is, we know that there's a notch in PCC, and the PC, the notch spacing between PCC can be like 10 millimeter or 15 millimeter. That would really affect it because then your PCC slab moves. So we took point three and point eight, and the friction, as I mentioned, the layer, the interface, the layer, the, the friction between the two surfaces is very important because if there is a debonding, then it's going to crack faster. So we took the exchange scenarios of fully bonded versus fully slip. And we have total of like 128 cases, 64 for non-interstate and 64 for interstate. Now, so this is a surrogate model. So this is not a model where like, you know, the extensive machine learning data, it's a surrogate model. So we try two surrogate models. One is linear regression, another one is neural network. So the first one, let's see the new, I'll explain the axis. So the X axis is your actual data. That is, we measured what we saw from the model. Your Y axis is your predicted data. And there are four plots here. It essentially means K1 represents stress intensity factor, J integral is J integral, and for your surface and binder course. So we try to use one model to predict all the four uh, uh, values. That is your stress intensity factor and J integral for your surface and your binder course. So the linear regression, performed okay, but my problem, biggest problem with linear uh, regression is it provide values of physical in insignificance. So what do I mean by that? You can see that, right? Like K, K1, which is a stress intensity factor, your actual, value, actual values are positive. However, in the prediction, it came out to be negative. So you're telling that when, when there is a crack, which is opening, if your K1 is negative, it means the crack is closing. So that is physically wrong. So, and also I understand why linear regression doesn't perform well, because it really lacks the complexity that we need between your input features and your output. Now, then we went to the neural network and the neural network is simply MLP, like multi-layer perceptron. Uh, it is of 10 cross 10 and it performed really better. Like it predicted all the four things, which is your K1 and J integral for binder and surface really well. And the disadvantage is we really don't know how each input feature is impacting the output but but to be fair we all like can be very sure that the linear relation linear regression which is of your input features correlating with the output linear leads it's easy to interpret because it's linear if you know your coefficients you can tell how much each parameter is influencing but that's not how the real world is real world is much more complex and machine learning or the mlp was able to capture it However, again, we don't know how each and everything is contributing to the final output. So this surrogate model was implemented in a website. And uh, in, so essentially, if the agencies want to compare two scenarios, they just give the properties of the configuration, like your binder thickness, surface thickness, your joint opening, your friction, your surface modulus and binder modulus. And if you were to click predict, so it gives you a value, which is average K1, which we found out to be a good measure to compare overlay scenarios. And using this, the agencies can use to compare two different scenarios, which one would be more prone to reflective quality. So the overall summary is a uh, model was developed using the test labs and we used a uh, computer factor parameters. We also saw that mode one was dominant. And the model, uh, the model was successfully validated and we found out average K1 is a good measure. And if you were to rank based on a K1, we were able to match actually the experimental ranks. And in order for agencies to use it, uh, utilize it easily, so we implemented this as a surrogate ANN model, which uh, based on 128 cases, and it was 
generalized and accurate. And it is a condition or like it should be used with a caution because it's still a surrogate model. Whatever the value that you're inputting should be within the range of the model. Or else if you want, it cannot be used to extrapolate results because we don't have enough data to extrapolate. So I finally want to thank the agencies, USDOT and FHWA. And I want to thank the TRP committee members, Sanger, John Sanger, uh, Rowden and Heckel. And I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Zavizi, Zavizu, Isaac, and uh, I know all of uh, the people who were here were helping me, helping us in the different aspects. So colleagues, then the ASC collaborators, we have Professor Ozer and uh, Ramadan, and re of course, research engineers, they were the, like the integral part of this entire project, which is your Greg, Uthman, and also uh, Mohsen and Mark. So with this, uh, I'll stop the test. Questions for Arabin? I can kick it off. <laughs> Arabin, can you elaborate a little bit more on the on that side that you have the linear regression and the neural network? Yeah. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about the inputs that you used for each one of them? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Thank you. So you want to know the input features, right? Yeah, and, and how were how they were different for for the linear regression and for the neural network. Okay, so the input remains the same, right? Like because you are inputting, you want to input your configuration, which is your thickness, your material properties, your joint opening, and friction coefficients. So those were the inputs, and they were same for both your linear regression and your uh, MLP or like the machine learning. Yeah. But the, yeah, did I answer your question? Okay, and how are these different from what you are bypassing? You're bypassing the EFEM model, right? Yes. So in the EFEM model, we use all of these and a little bit more, right? Yeah. So which ones are you not using for the, for this part that you did use for the EFEM? The inputs are the same, except for the surface modulus and the binder model, because I'm giving here, like there is only one value, whereas in the FEM model, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic modulus curve. And we chose only one value because the loading frequency of the test plate were fixed. So I was able to calculate what would be the modulus value at given temperature and given frequency. So that's the only difference between the model and the FEM. So now, follow-up question, the users of this tool, what modulus should they pick? Uh, I can open it. So if they have characterized your materials, what more do you see? Yeah. I use some here. Okay, I think you can go here. Yeah. So the model is at 70F, which is your uh, 21 Celsius. And eight hertz is what the value that you need to use. And just to give an, uh, one uh, example, so the idea was, so this was just for the input. Later on, we were thinking actually to use the box model. You just throw away all your gra aggregate gradation to get the dynamic modulus from there and directly input this. So that was the later idea when we actually implemented it on a website. So, but for now, when we created this, it was like done on immediate request. So you, you see my point? Yeah, and these settings are the ones that were used to be experimented. Yes. That temperature. Yes. So, also now that it is validated, probably we can extend the database to different temperatures and you know ex extend this data. But right now, it is only for the yeah, seventy Fahrenheit because that's what we did. Very uh, quick and made silly question. So, we're just we're using modulus as input. But for example, I can have a material, uh, let's say an asphalt mixture that have similar uh, modulus, but one was made of a modified SPS modified binder and the other one uh, unmodified binder. And I'm assuming that the one with the, probably the one with a uh, modifier will be more resistant to like the crack opening and propagation. So how would this model capture this? Because we're just inputting models. Okay. 
So just the software may not be known. Pass. But like let's say that you have uh, two different binder, or like two different mixes. Still, the dynamic model is where to, it has to reflect some at some frequency, something. So that has to reflect, that should be reflected in your abacus model. May not be to the intensity of uh, what you see in your experiments, because now, as I mentioned, this is a generalized model. You are not very much focusing on one specific aspect of material and how would it impact the crack door. The goal is overall, if you want to use these material properties, which one is more likely to be prone to reflect your crack door? You see my point? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I watched it many times, but every time I have more questions. So um, you you already answered this question. You said you used just one uh, loading frequency, which is eight hertz. Um, and I was wondering because I was wondering why would you use? I understand that you just want to cut your simulation matrix. You don't want to simulate so many frequencies. But also, why didn't you consider maybe? Um, a different loading frequency between interstate and non-interstate con conditions because in, in those two scenarios like speed is very different right and like maybe you could have just included um, two different scenarios uh, so answer directly the eight hertz is actually from the load sorry from the frequency of loading that we did in the test lab like whatever frequency that because it has its own limitation you cannot simulate like 70 miles per hour like the loading actuator that we have. So the frequency that you see here is actually from the experiment. Because imagine you are modeling the test labs, right? So when we want to compare, we are using the frequency that is being applied. But to answer your question, like why I didn't consider this, it's a good for future, like you know, to consider different uh, speeds, like for interstate, probably 40 minutes, you can go 70 minutes and see what will be the frequency and how does it impact the results. But intuitively, I feel that trend should be the same. The trends of uh, between like when you compare at lower speeds and under higher speeds, it should be almost the same. Unless or until you're talking about extreme speeds, where, like, so remember, see that, imagine the dynamic modulus curve, where you can see near, as you go on the uh, infinity modulus, long-term modulus and the instantaneous modulus, that's where the convergence is. But most of your life, you deal with the frequency that is in the center, like, like 10 hertz, zero to like 0 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz is what are most of the speed represents, where you see actually a lot of difference in the modulus values. You see my point? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a good uh, thing to explore more. Aditya. Okay. So, just for clarification, for whoever is watching us and wants to use this uh, this tool, what uh, what modules should they uh, input there? In, in which frequency should they like eight eight hertz plus seventy uh, Celsius eight hertz. Parents, uh, seventy parents, seventy parents, and uh, eight eight hertz, and ask ASA the units. Yeah. Uh, sorry for my limited knowledge, but when we like do the modeling stuff, can we just randomly select like the mesh size? Don't we check for like convergence and all those things? So, in this case, did you go through that? Yes. So, as I mentioned, yes, we did go. To answer your question simply, yes, we did go and uh, we used the standard abacus ways to say that, okay, this is a good mesh or this is not a good mesh. So, one of the key things is as you reduce the sizes, your values converge, like the results converge, but it takes more time. So, you kind of find your optimal value. So, that analysis we performed, but uh, yeah, the one analysis that this is why I mentioned the mesh validation for cracks, you need to do a separate analysis because you, you don't know the result is your J integral. So you want to try different, you know, element sizes and so on and so forth to see how smooth is your curve and how well it converges between the contours. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, just for uh, just for clarification, Professor Thompson asked on the chat, what was the testing temperature for this light? And I Assume it's seven to seven. Room temperature. Room temperature. I have another one for you. I think it's very relevant for for reflected cracking, the temperature at which we at which we, at which we test the development of the crack. So how how can we how can we explore that using the tools that you develop? So in the analysis. You can change your temperatures to a lower, like right now I'm using 75 minutes. You can pull that down to like a lower temperatures and compare. 
But will those results be validated? Because the idea is you want to use the model where it's validated, right? So in the using the tools, yeah, you can change the temperature and see which one is doing better and which one is not. But I will be concerned with the validation part of this. No, no, but with the FEM model. Yeah, with the FEM model, we can reduce the temperature. Temperature is important. Hmm. So we can change the temperature and do the same analysis. So you will get still the J integral, K1, you can compare this analysis. That makes sense. Uh, Professor Thompson just have another question. I think it's similar what I asked or what is the temperature that should be used for establishing HMA models? Seventy Fahrenheit as well. Uh, Professor Thompson, do you want to ask anything else? HMA models. HMA models. You are moving yourself. Not sure. Still asking. So just uh, so the testing temperature was seventy Fahrenheit. Yes. The HMA model's temperature should be seventy Fahrenheit as well. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yes, we have one more question. Yes. Um, how do you decide how far away from the test conditions that you trust your model? Uh, so you, you validated one set of parameters of the analysis, right? For yeah. The testing. And then you vary those parameters over some range. How do you decide what that range is that you trust your, your model? So if I understand your question correctly, you are asking how we chose the simulation method. Yeah, the method. Yeah. yeah. So the map, we chose the method based on the possibility of what is the lowest extent that I would go on your thicknesses. Okay. Yeah. So if you can see between the normal interstate for your surfaces, we chose 1.5 to 2 and 1.5 to 1.5. These these were chosen based on the alternatives. So we had like eight alternatives that was tested, right? We chose what is the lowest thickness, what is the highest thickness within interstate and or non interstate. And also within the material property to get the range. So you want to take the strongest and the weakest. So you're covering the extreme scenarios. So when you were to interpolate between the intermediate results, we should work fine to again to compare qualitatively. Like if I'm making sense to you. Okay. Yeah. But you only tested one, uh, one, one set. So the, the, the test that you did in the lab, so it was just one set of parameters, right? You didn't do both, like you didn't do a thick one and a thin one. Right? No, so, so you're asking about the experiments, right? So in the experiments, we did do eight scenarios. So oh. yes. Yeah, sorry. So as you can, oh, there you go. So these are the scenarios that we did the experimental testing. Okay. So the goal of the model is to validate the results using this, Validate the model and extend the model to interplay between possible scenarios in between these extremes. Yeah. The, I think, yeah. So, uh, so in your experimental testing, I, uh, I saw that the, when you applied the back force, it was not to, like, it, like applied at a lower rate. So it doesn't bond completely. But in the model, it started with the fully bonding and only two extreme cases. That is in the simulation matrix. So in the simulation matrix, we wanted to model the extreme conditions. However, in the validation cases, no, we assumed an intermediate frictional coefficient values from the literature to model that uh, you know interface layer. But for the simulation matrix, again, the extreme scenarios is what we are focused so in order for us to understand the what is the trend in the in between. Oh yeah. What level? Sorry, can I ask another question? Yes, exactly. <clears throat> I can really for three minutes work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what level of bonding did you use for the for the validating in these cases? Point one or point one five. Right? It's the it's, it's how it's based on the literature. I think if I'm not like so, there's a coefficient of friction, right? After which and there's a limit after which this layer starts sliding. So I think we, if I'm not wrong, it's point one or one, like like it's some values of coefficient of friction we use. That, that's a coefficient of friction that would represent the reduced. Funding. Yes. Yes. If no uh, more questions, let's again give a round of applause for the